and happy end of April. I'm excited to share with you all of the books that I read this month. There are some really great ones. First, I'm going to start with Orbital Cloud by Taiyo Fuji, and this book is so good. So we, we follow an amateur meteorologist and web designer. They both have untapped skills as of yet, and they discover these mysterious objects in low Earth orbit. So as they investigate this really complex case of what turns out to be global terrorism, we get an increasing cast of uh, international experts and spies, and amongst them our two main characters really come into their own. They're brilliant. They turn into this incredible space scientist, computer engineer duo who match wit and skills with the best of the best all over the world. And so they and their team, they're so very competent and I really love the story that centers so much in science and the author writes it in a way that um, is really smart but also really accessible. It's not overwhelming the crazy amount of uh, math and engineering and science and uh, it's a really cool how he writes that the plot like, has a lot of tension and suspense hanging on math and science. So this book is exactly the kind of read for me. Like I love nothing more than reading about um, really competent people in hard science fiction espionage thrillers. It's really perfect for me and I highly recommend this book. Another interesting book that I read this month is The Tea Master and the Detective by Alia de Bodard. I actually got a copy of this thanks to NetGalley, though I didn't read it till quite close to its publication date, so it is already out. And this book is about a mind ship who is a tea master, and because of that one line description, I had to pick up this book and read it because it sounded so interesting. In the book, we have the Shadow's Child, who is a mind ship that was traumatized in war, and so after that trauma is discharged from military service. Now she makes her living brewing tea for space travelers, though in this world, uh, tea is mind altering drugs. Uh, unfortunately for the Shadow's Child, this makes a pretty poor living, so a, a new customer comes along. And this latest customer is Long Chao, who is abrasive, uh, arrogant, though very, very intelligent. This character is modeled very much after uh, Sherlock Holmes. And so Long Chao hires the Shadow's Child for a job, and they go off to solve a mystery. And the mystery plotting is alright, though not the strongest aspect of this book. Really, the strengths lie in the characters and the writing and the world. We get a lot of this really interesting world in a very short novella length work. And for the characters, in The Shadow's Child, we have a personality that is intensely anxious and neurotic. And with Long Chao, we have a character who is so abrasive and arrogant. And the two of them have an interesting relationship, and they have this relationship where neither of them come off as sympathetic, exactly. <laughs> but with the value, the interesting value of this is that they were unlikable characters, which is unusual for female or even gender fluid characters. Uh, and I thought it was really fascinating to read about this crazy world with mind ships um, and a mystery where the two characters are so unlikable but you still enjoy reading it. So it was a pretty interesting book. Moving along to another book about a sentient spaceship because books about sentient spaceships are my jam, it is Embers of War by Gareth Powell. And this stars Trouble Dog, our hero warship who was ordered to make this brutal attack that was arguably a war crime. And in the wake of this, Trouble Dog's developing conscious grows horrified of this and she grows apart from her sister warships and um, in the wake of this she drops out, she resigns her commission and she takes up with the House of Reclamation. And now working as the House of Reclamation, her job is to go rescue ships in distress uh, regardless of the ship's affiliation in this large universe that is sometimes at conflict. And so when Trouble Dog and her crew receive the latest distress signal from a ship that's in a disputed system, they go to investigate. But they are not the only ones converging on this escalating incident. So this book is told from multiple first-person perspectives that switch each chapter. We go in a bit of a round robin, and it was really enjoyable getting to the heart of each person's perspective. We see from the, the first person's, at least characters, a lot of different perspectives on the story, so it was really intense, like you're really right in there. Like 
There is no dawdling in this book. From the first page you go straight into the action and you stay in the action throughout the entire book. And so this turned out to be a very um, overall fast, furious, fun read. Now let's talk about the only nonfiction book that I read this month. It is This Will Be My Undoing by Morgan Jerkins, and the subtitle of this is Living um, at the Intersection of Black, Female, and Feminist in White America. So first and foremost, this book is written by a young black woman for other black women. This is written very explicitly not for white feminists. So I really appreciated that point of view, that it was so direct and it really had this point that I wanted to make. And the essays that are in here are both personal and political, though more than the political, the personal really stood out, like they were so beautiful. She paints this vivid picture of being a young black woman in America. So the essays cover race and gender, uh, history, uh, politics, pop culture and really the challenges of living um, on the margins, on the edge of society, and on the outside. So it was the one of the most vivid uh, portraits of living on the outside in white America that I've read, and the author is so very smart. So overall, this book, it is written both very smartly and fiercely. Moving along to some rereads, I reread Seven Surrenders by Ada Palmer, which is one of my favorites. It's the sequel to Two Like the Lightning, and the, these two books, Two Like the Lightning and Seven Surrenders, has just one of my favorite worlds in science fiction. The world building is incredible. And something I will say of note in Seven Surrenders is that uh, this is a utopia where no one living can remember an actual war. No one's ever lived through one because the last war was 300 years ago. So in this world, we have a lot of discussion of politics and philosophy, and that's where this book really shines and it just outshines any other book that I have read. And in Seven Surrenders, the philosophy gets really religion heavy, which is really interesting. Like, I'm not religious, but the, the deep thoughtfulness was so fascinating. And though a very dense and challenging book, frankly, I still think because of the political thriller aspect of it, it's quite a page turner. So I've talked about this series a lot. I talked about it quite a few times, even just in 2017. But I will say that on reread of Seven Surrenders, I have come to even better like understanding and appreciation of the layers, and there's so much good stuff. It's one of my favorite books to reread, and so I just really highly recommend this series. I also reread the Daughter of the Lioness duology, which are made up of the Trickster's Choice and also Trickster's Queen. So this is set in the fantasy realm of Tortal, and in Tortal, the most legendary person probably is Alana the Lioness. She's a lady knight who is the champion of the King of Tortal, and so the uh, protagonist, though, in this series is Ali, who's the daughter of that famed lioness, and Ali's talents are quieter. They are in spy work, and Ali is stolen away from Tortal by the god of the Copper Isles and is taken there to protect this exiled royal family from assassination attempts. And then in the second book in this uh, little series, uh, Ali and the Rebellion, they try to put a, a half-blood queen on the throne. So Ellie's spy skills are put to good use in this like political thriller espionage book, and I love some good political espionage. And I also really loved the the family that Ali protects. Like I love the people of the Copper Isles. Though speaking of the Isles, so this series is the first Tortal one that is set not in. In Tortal proper, it's, it's set in a neighboring kingdom, and so we move from the primarily white population of Tortal to the colored population of the Isles, and despite this move, we still have a white protagonist. So I love Ali, but we could have had a much less privileged perspective and a more diverse one. But the rest of the cast is really diverse. We have awesome women, and obviously women of color in the Isles. They are so good. Like All of Tamara Pierce's books have so many strong women, and it is incredible. And what's really great is that this series is so different from the other series, that all the series in the Turtle Universe are really different. So I really appreciate that about Tamara Pierce's books, that though the series are all like related and connected, like all of the heroines really know each other. They're, they're kind of like a giant extended family. But each character is unique and very different. They go through completely different experiences, have different stories, and so each series, though there's a lot familiar in it, they're still fresh and really enjoyable each time. This month I also read a book of comics. It was Hurting Cats by Sarah Anderson, and we have here the internet 
possibly most relatable comic artist. She's back with another volume of just really funny comics about um, millennial introverts trying to adult. And this particular volume ends with a comic essay um, about young creatives and creating in the modern internet era. So she talks a lot about criticism and harassment and ultimately about not giving up on making stuff. So this volume continues to be a funny, um, comic continuation of her work, though I recommend her previous two volumes more strongly, so definitely start there. Moving along, I also read A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline Lengel, which I think I read a very long time ago as like a really small child, so I don't remember any of it. And with all the hype around the movie, I thought I'd see how A Wrinkle in Time went, and it didn't go super well, <laughs> to say the least. This book is about Meg and Charles Wallace. They are little weirdo siblings, and their parents are scientists. Their father actually mysteriously disappeared after working with the fifth dimension. So now a stranger arrives at their house, and it's apparently time for Meg and Charles Wallace to go save their dad. And it just wasn't that interesting of a book. There is some heavy-handed morality going down in here, and worst of all, the main character Meg is so annoying. She shrieks, she overreacts, she depends on other people to, to save her, to do things for her. She complains so much and just she's really unbearable. I'm really disappointed uh, by this because I've heard such good things about the movie, but it's gonna have to be a while. I need a very long break after having to deal with such an annoying uh, protagonist in the book before I can go see the movie, so very disappointed in A Wrinkle in Time. Now let's talk about something instead that's crazy awesome. It is Space Opera by Catherine Valente, and here's the hook. Galactic Eurovision rock and roll glam told in the style of Douglas Adams. Really, that's all you need to know. It is the best read-alike for Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It's absurd and ridiculous. But a little bit more description about the premise. So after the Sentience Wars, the galaxy decides that they don't want to do this whole war thing anymore. And so the space-faring civilization so they decide that the substitute for war is going to be this meta-galactic Grand Prix. It's a glam show, it's a singing competition, and now when humankind joins the galaxy, it needs to compete via singing competition, and it's so crazy absurd. It's just all glam rock fun, and there's not really plot in here. Like, nothing really happens. All the words are just describing ridiculous things, but I think it's so ridiculous that you can enjoy the ride. Moving along, I also read The Queen's Rising by Rebecca Ross, and this is a beautifully written book. The pages really flew by, and our main character is a young woman who, uh, at first, at the beginning of the book, she goes to this elite boarding school where she studies, and the girls are even divided into houses. There's this whole medieval fantasy vibe going on, and it's not that interesting for that first um, chapter, but after that, when she graduates, she accepts a patronage that involves restoring a land's rightful queen to the throne, and that's when you get some like real serious medieval fantasy plotting going on. But really, the strength of this book is in the beautiful writing and the characters and the relationships, like the love in this and then the family that our main character finds. They're all just really heartening and beautiful to read about. Lastly, I want to talk about a couple of books that are being published in May and June, respectively. First is Only Human by Sylvain Nouvelle. This is going to be published on May 1st, and I got an advanced copy thanks to NetGalley. So this is the concluding volume of the Themis Files trilogy, and it's a really addictive series that goes at a rip-roaring pace. It features uh, ro giant robot battles, and it's told in the epistolary style, so it's really quite the page-turner. So in this book, we have followed a cliffhanger. The second book ended on our main characters being suddenly transported to an alien world. And what happens next is not what I would have predicted. <laughs> And things back on Earth are also really bad. Like, humanity has just gone over the edge. Fear and paranoia has driven humanity to extreme racism, extreme nationalism, and it's a really dark place on Earth. So the, the book Only Human is told in this dual timeline, so we follow our main characters uh, on their return to the really shitty Earth and also during their time while they're on the alien world. 
Um, this book is not what I expected. This is not how I expected the series to end, but it's still really solid. Uh, it wasn't exactly better or worse than how I thought this was going to go. So this book series is really great for if you need a break from what you're reading, if you are in a slump and want to really get back into something. I think the epistolary style really lends itself to breaks and breaking slumps. Um, so overall, very, very solid series. And last, but certainly not least, it is Revenant Gun by Yoon Ha Lee. I got an advanced copy thanks to NetGalley, and the publication date is June 12th. I'm very excited for sci-fi readers to get a hold of this book. It is the last book in the Machineries of Empire trilogy, and I love this series. Because, oh, that ending, the ending of Revenant Gun, I have major feels about it, and inside I was crying and like kind of a little bit screaming inside is <laughs> really great. I don't want to talk about too much premise because we really are have built up to an interesting place by the third volume. If you're not familiar with the series, it is a mind-boggling military sci-fi where reality and technology, etc., they are defined by high-level mathematics and adherences to belief and behavior systems, and sometimes heretics come by and they try to introduce uh, competing rules to change the power dynamics of the world. So the world building, the writing, it continues to be so very good in this series and the characterization gets even better. We have these awesome heroes, anti-heroes, and villains. The prominent villain in this book is very good. So it's great and there's like dubious morality all over the place. I absolutely love it. This is one of my favorite series and I think that's all I'll say about this. So with that, it's a wrap on this video. Till next time, my lovelies.